Hey, boys and girls, guys and gals, moms and dads, we're back with another episode of Chopping It Up with dot, dot, dot. Um, before I get to the dot, dot, dot person, um, for you people who are joining us for the first time, first of all, where the hell have you been? <laughs> we were waiting for you. <laughs> But if you are here for the first time, this is a very unique uh, format, long form content, real world, grown up conversation, not safe for little ears usually. Um, and it's just me and one of the superstars in direct selling, leverage sales, MLM, party plan, somebody in the profession who's doing amazing things that them and I, we just get together and we chop it up. We have a private conversation about the real world stuff of how success is created in the business. And you guys get to eavesdrop. We put it up on the Duplication Nation YouTube channel and it's blowing up in podcast form now. We're now, it's Duplication Nation MLM podcast on Apple, Google, Anchor, Spotify, really any of uh, all of the real big platforms. Um, so this has turned into the PhD program for empowering leadership. And it's because of the caliber of the guests that I'm speaking with each week. We put up a new show every Wednesday. It's the caliber of those people and their willingness to just be real and talk about how it's really done. So the dot, dot, dot this week, the name that follows that is Angelo Lacari. Who is joining us from his home in Texas, Angelo. Great to see you, thanks for coming on the program. Thank you, Randy. What an honor. And it's a privilege to be here. And I know you have done just tremendous work getting this word out about we are an amazing industry and it's all about, you know, helping people live better. And that's what we're doing. And it's exciting that you have a very unique message. And I think our messages align here. And so I'm, I'm honored to be here and hopefully we can add value, you know, to many, many people. So thank you. Yeah, so this is the first episode with two Wisconsin boys chopping it there up. There we go. That's right. <laughs> and I think the logical place to start, at least for me, is how does a guy from Stevens Point, Wisconsin, meet his bride-to-be, who's from Mexico, how does he meet her in Switzerland, I think? That's <laughs> crazy. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, that's a um, great place to start. You know, I, I grew up in a home and I was homeschooled up until 13 years old. Very, my, my parents had a very adventurous spirit and I went to school. And, you know, once before I thought I would get into and really settle down after college, I'm like, I need to go and do a cultural study school, a youth with a mission. So I just I went to Switzerland after, after I graduated college. And she happened to be in that same school at the same time as I was. She was the only, there was other Americans there, but she was the only Mexican there. And, uh, you know, when I saw her and, and we got to know each other, we started a relationship that what ended up being a breakup for two years, which is crazy in itself. Wow. And two years, we'd completely lost touch. And two years later, uh, we got back in touch and then shortly after got married. But you know, it's crazy when you look at, you know, that's just my relationship with my wife, right? How that happened, but in network marketing as well. I mean, how people get involved and how just getting out there and talking to people, you never know how things can happen and who knows who and who. And it's just a fun, fun life when when you're out there excited and, and moving forward. So she she had been, um, you know, she grew up in Guadalajara, Mexico, and and it, it's just uh, interesting to see my brother was in Switzerland. I went to that specific base because I thought I would spend a little time with him and she happened to be there. And so it's it's pretty wild. 
Yeah, and uh, for people who are watching, um, Bricia, who's the wife in question we are discussing, um, did an episode of this already. I don't know, probably five, six episodes back by the time this one is posted. Brilliant wisdom and insights in that show. If you haven't seen that show, you got to see it. And I love, you know, I, I don't know, I made this conscious decision that I wanted to break up the couples. So like I broke up you guys, I broke up Orion and Hilda, because um, I love getting the different perspective yeah. of each side. Because uh, when you have a, a couple who's building together like you you are and they are, the, Hilda and Orion are, it's really fascinating to see the different perspective, the different dynamics that people bring. The so the cultural studies, I just I love the sound of that, those two words. Was is that a um a university program, a church program? Who how does that uh, who organizes that or how does that come about? It's an organization called Youth with the Mission. They have probably 1500 to 2000 bases around the world. And it, it is a Christian focused and um, they they do basically the pro the first entry level program that you do. It's called the Discipleship Training School. It's six months long. And the first three months is learning about a culture, you know, kind of more internal. And then the next three months is external. Go and serve and help people in different countries. And so they train you and then they equip you to go out and and share and help people and pray for people and all these things. And. And she actually went to India during her out. It's called an outreach. And I went to Egypt and Lebanon and, uh, you know, two, two and a half months in Egypt. And then it was two weeks in Lebanon and she spent her time in India, you know. And, and so then we came back and debriefed and, and, and did all that. And it's just a fabulous program. And if you want, you can continue doing that. You know, you can stay in that organization and continue. It's volunteer work. So they don't it's not paid at all. It's all volunteer and she stayed for, you know, when we um, broke up, she stayed in that for those two years, stayed in that organization for those two years traveling. She's been in like 40 countries. And I came back and and, and went back. I went to school in Minnesota and, and started, um, you know, I was focused on business. I wanted to, ha you know, have a lifestyle for myself. That's kind of my belief from when I was 15 years old that I wanted to have time and money. That was my goal when I was 15. I'm like, I got to get time and money. And, and, you know, that's the goal. And I, you know, and, and some people, my dad, he, you know, he, he was growing up and just the idea that you have to work for 40 years of your life. And that's what I saw him do. He was a water chemist at a university in Stevens Point, the university of, you know, USTP Stevens Point. And he was there for many years and, and I just saw him. That's what, that was life. And so, um, he they got involved in Amway. My parents did, which is crazy. You know, Amway when I was 15 years old. And then that's when I started reading. Wow, you can have time and money. And that's how the whole belief thing started, you know. And so I went back to Minnesota thinking I'm going to, you know, get time and money. I was still believing in Amway, you know, and and parking cars. That's that's what, you know, I ended up doing in valet parking in Minnesota in the winter. Not fun. <laughs> <laughs> you get you know you know the gloves they they that cover up this much of your hand half of your hand because you need your fingers right to, 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 to the tickets and the writing and so right. you pray that oh. your fingers would go numb you know oh, so, yeah. so that you could keep working <laughs> so oh, wow yeah. so uh, let's well man a lot of places I I want to go based <laughs> on that um, so first. How do you think that experience of visiting other cultures, doing that program, how did that paid off for you in terms of the business and just in terms of your life, your, your, you know, who you are? Wow. I think, boy, that's a really good question. I, I am really believing and I think that that those experience really helped me to be a more of a humble person and always know 
you know, no matter how people, however they've gotten started, whatever their life is like, I'm not, I'm not better than anyone. Our, my wife and I were never, you're never better than anyone. And having that understanding that people are where they are for a reason and don't ever put yourself as better than anyone else, no matter how low someone is. And, you know, you, you, cause we never know a person's story, you know, they're, people are where they are for a reason and and they've had bad breaks and to 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 when i see people that are arrogant and and our, and we have this in our industry you know like people get on stage and they get so they think they're so amazing right and just those experiences that i had in my past just help i think form my character to really understand that people have they buy their starter kit they're at ground zero just like we did and understand that, understand where they are, and also being able to step by step walk them, you know, to, to help them grow personally and to, to have a substantial business, right? Um, but never losing that, you know, we've been financially free for eight and a half years. But no matter who I'm talking to, it it's just being able to really come from a perspective of I'm not better than them. And I think that those experiences have helped me help me be, be you know, form my character like that. And, and Brice is the same way. So yeah, I just, I think, I just wish every child got a chance to travel and, you know, like spend time in some kind of an exchange program. If I had been able to do that, my life would have been so much more enriching so much earlier. Um, fortunately, I, I discovered it early on. Maybe I was 20 years old and I was the president of a chamber of commerce where I had my business and somebody approached me and said, Hey, we got to start a travel agency and working in Latin America. And so I took a trip to Peru and that was the first time I'd ever left the United States and man, the culture shock. And then of course, getting in this really getting involved in this business. So I've now, I've built and trained in uh, 51 or 52 countries now, and I've visited more than 70. And the, the perspective that gives you being in those places, it's people wouldn't have. Well, actually, yeah, by the time people have are seeing this one, the, the show I did with Jordan Adler will be up. And so Jordan and I were commiserating with each other. I'm like, every time I take my Land Rover in, it's if I get an oil change, it's two thousand dollars. If it's a tire sensor, it's three thousand dollars. If it's you know an oil change in this, it's four thousand. And he's like, Are you kidding? I had this sports car to get a I don't think it was a brake pump or fluid pump or something. He had to pay sixteen thousand dollars because they had to take out the engine to do you know whatever, and I was regaling him with this. I forget which car it was of mine. The battery it needed a new battery was sixteen hundred dollars. I'm like, listen, I know the Sears Die Hard is the best battery in the world, and it's two hundred dollars. I will, I will call Uber. And I will buy a Sears battery and I'll have it delivered. And they're like. Oh no, you can't do that. This battery is wired up to this system and that system. And you have to have this. And so we had to laugh, like, you know, oh, such problems we have, right? Mm -hmm. How many people would are sitting saying, these two son of a bitches sitting here <laughs> complaining about they have to spend sixteen thousand dollars on repairing their four hundred thousand dollar car? You know, I don't ever lose sight of that. And I, you know, when I go to San Salvador, when I go to Guadalajara, when I go to Dominican and, you know, it reminds, because, you know, I came from very poor, very simple background and, you know, you can easily get power drunk, ego drunk once you start making money and start thinking you're better and, you know, the the universe will fix that very quickly. It will send you a lesson which will teach you, oh, no, we are all, you know, whether you want to call it children of God or equal people or whatever you want to call it. Um, but the other thing when you tell that story that jump out at me beside the cultural thing 
the idea of, first of all, it's so cool that you're a second generation network marketer, right? I think yep. there's a number of people who watch this show who are now second and even a few third generation ones. But the idea that at 15 years, because you and I, and I think probably everyone who watches or listens to this would agree, nobody builds the dream better than Amway. Nobody builds the belief better than Amway. The book of the week, the you know book of the month, the tapes of the week, those programs. So the idea that you got exposed to those at 15 years old, I think that's that had to be, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I would think that had to be one of the most powerful, influential things in your life. Yeah, the, the mind, the mindset, the mind shifting, uh, learning and growing really who that we can believe, you know, we can be whoever we believe that we are, all those principles that we know, those personal development principles that we know. And really doing, I mean, personal development since when, since 15 has, I, I had, I just had a book I was looking at that I, in 1996, I had these notes, this one page notes of a book called Created for Excellence. And I, and I put those things in your mind and your heart, you know, and, and really honed in on those principles and believing it. And, uh, you know, and, and, from an early age, being able to flip the mind and, and say, you know what, I don't have to get a job for 40 years. Like, and you know, it's interesting because believing it, it, I, I just did a presentation for our company called unlocking the power of belief. And really, I mean, if I were, if anyone, if you believe that you need to get a job and work for 40 years, well, that's exactly what's going to happen. That's just it. It's simple. You know, that's how you're believing and thinking that's what's going to happen. And so at 15, when that switched, you start looking for other ways, you know, of, of what's the goal, right? And my goal was having time and money so that when I one day have kids, you know, I could have the freedom to be able to spend time with them. And so um, never losing sight of that. And, you know, even taking it a step further, Randy, which is what I wanted to do because, you know, I've been now in network marketing for a long time, but really why taking a step further in the sense, why personal development, what is it doing? And I, and I went down this road, which is, I'm just probably one of the most exciting things that I've studied. What happens in our brain when we exercise positive thinking, what happens to our DNA when we exercise negative thinking and I, I studied six different books and looking at doctors and scientists taking, you know, and really understanding scientifically. And it, it blew my mind the amount of people that are writing about what happened. Our, we can change our brain. We are, are, are actually when we are negative and toxic, our DNA tightens up. And, it, and, it, and different DNA codes. And so anyway, I could go down a road about that. But th this is fascinating. And I think, it, it, you know, when you there's a whole thing behind personal development in our brain, what happens. And, and that's why we all need to be passionate about personal development and growing, which is why I love what you're doing, because this is what you, I mean, you're helping people personally grow and help them change their mind and grow. And, but there's a whole nother area of, of science that is behind this. And I wanted to, I think this is a good moment. I can ask you, do you, you were very, you're very passionate about the project forgive and forgiveness. Is that right? With Sean? Uh, I, I wanted Sean to do parent. Yeah. This, uh, cause that, that's a whole forgiveness is huge in, in our business too. And, and being able to move on, but can you, I wanted to learn about that. And what, what is that? Sean has one of the most amazing stories you'll ever encounter. Um, she was incested as a child by her stepfather and her mother, her, you know, natural birth mother was just a, a victim of abuse as well. And, had fallen into these cycles. And so Sean was actually, you know, went to her mother and said, he is coming in my bedroom at night. He's, you know, when I come home from school, I mean, just the most horrific, you know, the, just the, 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 the most 
horror, I don't know, horrific is the only word can come to mind, stories. And the mother was like, well, what are you doing to bring that on? You must be leading him on. You know, you got to stop doing that. That's your fault. I mean, just imagine as an impressionable child being, and that's what uh, abusers do is they make the people they abuse believe it's their own fault. They make them believe it's not worthy. And so Sean had just the most horrific mental issues from that, right? I mean, how could you not? And her mother, and later the stepfather was out of the picture, but her mother was so abusive in, in, in order to like protect her own, you know, hurt people, hurt others. And so her mother was hurting her for her entire life. And somewhere along the way, and, and, and Sean is a very, she was a very high level successful journalist who won a bunch of Emmy awards for uh, reporting. And she happened to report on a story of someone she, two families that she knew in her uh, hometown, which is somewhere in Michigan, if I remember correct. And one, this guy got drunk, went out driving drunk and killed a child that of a family that I think that he knew they were like family and somehow it just happened. And, and so this family forgave him and Sean reported on this and, and it kind of led her down that rabbit hole of forgiveness which led her down to her own situation with her mother. Mm -hmm. um, for people who read my Radical Rebirth book, there's a story in there about someone who came, you know, who came to me for advice with an abusive mother who was dying of cancer. And I, you know, my advice to her was cut off all contact with your mother. Even though she's dying of cancer and she has this tragic tale, it's not safe for your own mental health to be receiving this abuse from someone that is in this kind of a control position over you. And um, so Sean went on this really complex journey of how did she forgive her mother, you know, for everything that happened to her. And also this story of this uh, guy who killed the child drunk driving. And so she started a Project Forgive uh, documentary, which is not actually out yet, but it's been, you know, edited and researched and filmed. And uh, um, I have a little spot in it um, where, you know, she invited because I forgave the guy who shot me. Right. Mm -hmm. Although I never met him, I just mentally because I had to do that to move on. Um, so the whole film, the whole documentary is stories like that. And she interviewed just Nelson Mandela and all kind of amazing people. And at some point it'll come out. Um, but people can Google Project Forgive and they can, um, you know, follow the updates and find out when it comes out. But yeah, forgiveness, it's just. One of my books was on the seven uh, principles of prosperity, and one of them I isolated as forgiveness. And like, it doesn't matter if I'm talking to an audience of 500 people or 20,000 people. I can always ask the same question and get the same answer. I could say, who is the one person, the hardest person in the world it is for you to forgive. <laughs> and if it's 10,000 people, 10,000 people will shout out in unison, myself. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's just one of, you know, we actually were chatting a little before the camera went on and we, we, you said, you know, it's just like, there's no perfect people. There's no perfect church. Yeah. That's it. We have all done things that we could, you know, we can never go back and undo. Yeah. We can apologize, we can make amends, but everyone 
every one of us has done something to yeah. hurt another in a way that we probably can't undo. And you have to, at some point, forgive yourself if you ever want to move forward. And, um, and then just say, okay, like, you know, as an addict, I lied and manipulated people and just did terrible things that I could never justify, mm -hmm. never. And I can never um, heal the hurt that I caused people who were close to me and, and became collateral damage in that. So all I can do is, which I did, was to forgive myself and say, it's I can pay it forward. I can't pay it back, but I can pay it forward. And, and that's really, so forgiveness, yeah, that really is yeah. near and dear to my heart. <laughs> yeah, I think people beat themselves up a lot, you know, they, in, the, in this business and their family, whatever it is, they, they, they make a mistake and they don't let them, they, they, that mistake haunts them the rest of their life because they aren't able to move on. And, and that's so true. I've, you know, I see it in our business. I've seen it in my own life, you know, stink. I call it stinking thinking, you know, it really is what it is. And, 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 having making when when a mistake happens having it paralyze us and then we have let fear if the unforgiveness will let fear come in and then we're living a life of fear and we're paralyzed and we don't do the things we need to be doing all because we're unable to move on from that one bad choice we made well get over it it's hard i know forgive yourself it's a new day move on and and uh it's it's a you know personal development lesson i think that's one of the key ones, you know, and, and, uh, it's, I'm glad that we could touch this because that's, you know, I think we're the, the, the same feeling and thinking about that. So that's great. Yeah. The, the, the kind of basic premise of the radical rebirth book was, um, birth from death that, um, I, and by the way, I, most people who have, even people who have read the book, don't know this story because I didn't share it in the book because I didn't even know the lesson when I wrote the book or the the impetus that drove me. But I have a file here in a location that has a journal. And in, in that journal is my farewell to the world letter that I wrote one Christmas Eve, as I was at the uh, airport Marriott here in Miami and figuring, okay, it's time to check out of this world. And uh, I had been in this relate, you know, it, like the, it was the 11th negative dysfunctional relationship in a row that I was in, right? And the names changed and the faces changed, but the relationship was always the same it was and i'm like are these people just going and getting plastic surgery and changing their name and come, how come every time and you know it took that uh, 11th one for me to realize well there is one common denominator there is one person in all 11 of those relationships mm -hmm. that didn't do any plastic surgery and didn't change his name and he kept coming back so maybe he has something to do with all this negative dysfunction, right? Um, so fortunately, uh, that breakup of that had happened because we agreed to do couples therapy. And after a certain a real, a period of time, we which something happened in the therapy, which is, I think, what happens a lot is you go in and you have your first session with the therapist. And they know exactly what's wrong with you and exactly what you need to do to fix it. But if they told you, you would immediately fire them, walk out, say you're full of shit. You don't know what you're talking about. And that would be the end. So they go through therapy sessions and they let you come to the realization yourself. Right. So we go through this therapy and we realize we're not in love with each other. We're in love with the idea of being in love. It's we bought in this romantic ordeal and, ordeal and, you know, ideal. And we have this beautiful house and the picket fence and we have the shaggy dog. And it, but 
we don't even, you know, neither one of us loved ourselves enough that we could love someone else. Mm -hmm. So I'm in the, so we finally break up and I say, listen, I don't, you know, I want to be a good guy. I don't want this to be messy. I don't want this to be negative. Take the house, take the furniture. You got your car. I got my car. I'm going to take my car and my clothes and you take everything else. I will pay all the bills. You go out, you know, start your new life. I want to be a good guy. So now it's Christmas Eve. I, so what do I do? I have, you know, 27 billion frequent, you know, hotel point miles with Marriott because I'm this jet sure. setting speaker going all over the world. Because, of course, I instead of deal with my relationships, I schedule business trips and <laughs> go out of town because that's all I could do emotionally at that point. So I've got all these billion miles. So I cash them in and I go to the airport Marriott. Now, like an idiot, I don't think, you know, I should go to the Marriott in Hawaii or Fiji or no, I pick the damn airport Marriott in Miami, which is just in this depressing airport zone with a view of like the, you know, whatever courtyard dumpster next door. <laughs> it's Christmas Eve. And I'm like, right. And, and fortunately, I called my therapist and fortunately he called me back and, you know, talked me down and that I never knew until after I wrote radical rebirth, that that was the impetus for writing that book. Wow. Because what happened over the course of, from that moment on was I realized I don't have to kill myself. I can kill off the parts of myself that I don't like. I can kill off the, the parts of me that I hate. Mm -hmm. I don't hate myself. I just hate parts of myself. Sure. And so that book is kind of, I, I, break, the, I break the world down into seven areas, you know, money and success, God and religion, uh, uh, you know, marriage and relationships. And so I break it in that. And then I look at the negative beliefs that we can develop, the negative mind viruses and programming that's out there, whether it's, you know, money is bad, rich people are evil, all of the bad things about health and wellness that, you know, we think Cheetos and Fritos and Doritos are food. We think, you know, peach cobbler is the same as eating peach or uh, carrot cake is the same. Well, it's healthy dessert. I'm eating carrot cake. No, you're eating a goddamn piece of cake with 2,800 calories with half a pound of sugar in it. And yeah. yeah, there's probably a couple of carrot peels in there somewhere, but that's not health, right? But we bought into that. So it's the book is about all these limiting beliefs that we bought into in each of these areas and then you know recognize what is the bad belief we adopted in that area how to kill off that belief yeah. and replace it with an empowering belief oh, yeah. so we can say well no uh money is not evil being rich is not evil imagine the good work I will be able to do if I'm wealthy, right? So we take the negative belief and we replace it with the empowering belief. And, but all of that, that all goes back to forgiveness, right? Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And be, yeah, exactly. Forgiveness and, and knowing that we're not better than anyone and all those things that, you know, that we've learned, but um, that's just fascinating. I didn't, I didn't know that I need to read that book. I'm going to read it. I'm going to get it right away. As soon as I, as soon as we are finished here, I'm going to go buy it. <laughs> it sounds very powerful. Very yeah, cool. it's 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 the first book I wrote that I think is the it's the 14th book, and I think it's really the culmination of the first 13. Mm -hmm. It's where because I had written a five book series on prosperity, I have four or five books on network marketing, direct selling, 
And then I had a couple of books just about for entrepreneurs, you know, Mad Genius and Risky is the New Safe were they're really manifestos for entrepreneurs. And but Radical Rebirth is where I think I took all of my philosophies, all of my principles, all of my experience and said, here's how it works together. Here's how you put your your work life and your personal life and your spiritual life and how you you know, begin to recognize the parts of you that you can kill off yep. and you can be born again as the new you, the one you want to become. And, yep. you know, that's like you, you were so blessed, I think, to get those Amway books and tapes at 15 years old. Um, I got them at 20. Because yeah. that's when I was introduced to the Amway Corporation. And oh my God, it was it was like people were talking in Swahili. I yeah. had never, <laughs> I never read books like that. I never listened to audios or watched videos like that. There was just, uh, you know, you could trace my ancestry back to the whoever came over on the Mayflower and go back to, you know, where it all began in Czechoslovakia and <laughs> France and Germany. And uh, there's nobody in, in a thousand generations of my family that had ever read a book like Think and Grow Rich or right. a, a Magic of Thinking Big or, you know, that was yeah. just it was it was so transformational for me. And I don't know how we do it, Angelo, but we have got to get people back to reading books again. Yes. Yeah. I, that's, and that's why I, I when I was going to close this event, our convention, I didn't want to just tell people to how important it was. I, I wanted to do my own digging with, what happened and and i think the i mean i know the message got through and that's what i want to really stress to people is really what what is happening scientifically in your mind when you have negative toxic beliefs and the the dangers of that and you know you you this the the negative gene the this the dna code there's genes that switch off and will not manifest when you're in a negative train of thought and so the importance of picking up a magic of thinking big, big magic of thinking big or a Neapolitan whole thinking girl rich or you know many many books I'm a big Ogmandino guy as well and so the these 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 things it's more important now now more I always knew it was important I know I believe that our success today is because of the personal development through the years I and now I see more than ever how true that is in a scientific level and it's fascinating. And I think we all need to uh, really s separate time every day. And I, I recommend in the morning, I do it every morning, um, a personal development time, uh, whatever it is that you want to grow and learn, you have to do it. I think I believe early be so that you can have a better day. I mean, that's just the, we all want to have great days all the time and it doesn't always happen like that. But to have more great days than bad days, if you do personal development in the morning, you're going to have a lot better, uh, a lot better day moving forward. And you're going to be more productive because mentally you're going to be. I mean, let's just look at it. We always everyone talks about events, right? How important are events? you got to go to events. Well, I mean, when you look at what happens in events. Uh, people get excited. They get a mental. They they get a mental wake up call. If they've never been to one before, and they make decisions at those events. They'll be, you know decisions that'll change their lives and, and send them down a road of success. You know, but I, I've been home at home by myself reading a personal development book, and that same feeling I feel in the convention. I can get right here sitting in the chair because you get excited about your life, right? And yeah. that's, I mean, you get excited about doing something substantial and not just falling back to where you have been for many years, but really getting up and going after and going and doing the activities, right? The prospecting, the inviting and all the things that we know are successful. Um, but you can have, you know, you can have those same feelings in a chair, reading a book that's going to move you forward. And there was you know, my wife and I, we, we had five years of our life where we put the TV away. We had no TV because it was garbage, right? You guys, 
I mean, we, I think, you know, you know it more than me, but you know, we, you were talking about the carrot cake and we, what we, we put garbage in our, in our bodies. Right. But we feed our minds a lot of garbage. And I think it's a, it's a very important aspect of all of our lives. We need to feed our minds good things. And now more than ever, I see how powerful it is. And I, I, I think, you know, you can you can have a terrible product and a terrible company, but if you believe you can be a successful, it'll work. Like that's how powerful belief is. You know, yes, you need to have a good company. Yeah, and all those things we need that, but the mind is more powerful than we think. And uh, it's it's being able to see, you know, the 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 feelings of love and joy and appreciation and gratitude. Those feelings can reverse those toxic feelings and those toxic beliefs and start the DNA in your mind and working how it should work. Right. And, and so it's, it's, it's pretty fascinating. And I'm glad I could talk about it today because hopefully it'll impact people and help them, you know, to really, really see the importance of personal development in their lives. Yeah. Two thoughts on that. One, something I learned from Naval Ravankant is he says, Hey, let your kids read whatever they love until they develop a love of reading. So whether it's comic books, graphic novels, it doesn't matter. If it gets them so they love to read, then once that's there, they'll migrate their way to stuff that will be much more powerful for them. Um, And somehow we have to convey that to our teams. There's Mm -hmm. just to i remember who i might have been when i did this show with eric gamio and he he asked me about relationships and you and brisi are so blessed because you're two souls on the same path of positive growth and self-development and um there's not there's not a big enough percentage of the population who are into that. So the, the, you know, like for me to have a relationship and I'm a very, very, very smart guy. So the gene pool of my potential mates is not as broad as it might. And I'm gay. So yeah. each time we, we restrict the gene pool a little more. Yeah. So I, I think it was Flacco. I was talking about relationships with, and I say, you know, it's for me, like, the first date when you went to someone's house, the f- what I, I made my initial judgment. And of course, we should never judge people. But of course, we always judge people. So I would make my initial judgment by their bookcase. Right. So I go over the bookcase and I want to see what they're reading. And that tells me who this person is. But. You can't do that anymore because people don't have bookcases. Yeah. They're, they're, you know, if you if you go in a hundred homes, I don't know, I think 75 of them probably don't have a bookcase. Yeah. Right. And the the later millennial generations. So I, I was dating somebody um who was like 38. So he's much younger than me, right? So, but we met through an app and, you know, we start dating and, you know, it's definitely, there's a generational thing going on and I'm into this positive growth and self-development. And this is kind of like a foreign language to him. And so um, first time he comes to my house, he, I have a picture there with me and a president of the United States, which the White House sent me. And he's like, oh, that's you. Oh, cool. Okay, not how did that happen or how did you meet him or right. wow, Sorry. it says President Barack Obama, February, you know, the, no, nothing like that. And a little later, he says, you know, what do you do? Um, I'm an author. Oh, you mean books? Yeah. You Have you written a book? Yeah, I've written 14 of them. Oh, cool. Not, but what are they about or what's the title? Can I see one or, right. you know. If, 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 you know, call me weird, but if I meet you and you tell me you wrote a book, I'm going to buy your book. Right. Right. Like I'm playing softball league in San Diego. There were two guys who were authors. I immediately went home and ordered their books on Amazon. Right. And 
I'm going to, and I took them, Hey, sign your book. I want, you know, because I'm an author that speaks to me, right? I'm, and mo much more than I'm an author, I'm a reader, right? So this is, books are sacred to me. But I don't know, I, I, if a thousand people, if, if I meet a thousand, well, say that isn't going to happen a thousand, but if I meet, you know, 50 people in day-to-day -day life and they find out I'm an author, maybe one of them would say, well, really, what's it about? Tell me, what are your books? You know, or, or they would buy one or they'd ask me to sign one, right? 49. So this guy was that same way. Like, okay, yeah. So I'm dating this guy. He wrote 14 books. He has no desire whatsoever to know what they're about. And right. something came up, we were debating. And I, so I said, you know, I have a thing in my radical rebirth book that I'm talking about that. It's, you know, this chapter you know, here's the book, you know, read it and let me know what you think. He never reads right. it, right? It's five days later, he still hasn't read it. So then um, he sends me about a fundraiser for autism. Well, I'm actually on the spectrum. So this is a cause near and dear to my heart. So I say, hey, I'm going to put this up on my Facebook and Twitter and all those things. So I post for his fundraiser. Mm -hmm. So for, for for the first time ever, he goes to look at my social media accounts because sure. he has no interest about that because, you know. Right, why right. <laughs> so he goes to my social media account and he all of a sudden my phone starts blowing up. Bing, 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 bing with all these, you know, WhatsApp voice notes. And he's like, Oh my God, I just went to Twitter and looked at your thing and Ellen DeGeneres followed you. Who are you? How could, man, uh, uh, Ellen DeGeneres, how, uh, why does she, and bang, 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 just message after message. So if I said, you know, I won the Nobel Prize in literature, he would have said, oh, that's cool. If I said, well, I won the Nobel Peace Prize because I, yeah. created peace between yeah. Israel and, oh, cool. But yeah. Alan DeGeneres <laughs> followed me on Twitter. <laughs> oh, my God. Now I was worthy of, right? So, sure. Sure, I sure. don't know. There's just so, and I know this is a long rambling rant, but it, it's, I just, if we can get um, the later millennial generations right. to fall in love with reading, mm -hmm. It will open up such a new world for them. Yeah. Because they're proud of it, right? They're like, I never read a book. I haven't read a book since college. You know, the Gary V is like, I've written more books than I've read. You know, <laughs> like that's a badge of honor. Right. And we got to change that mentality. We got to, you know, the, 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 and, and I know we have everything available or almost everything on right. the internet. Yeah, but I think the mental discipline that a well-written book, yep. you know, it takes, it sets a premise and then it prosecutes the case. Yeah, you mentioned Ogmandino. That was yep. the other thing that jumped out. So yep. they say you should never meet your heroes. Well, I got to meet Og, and wow. he was just a prince. Wow, he was just the dream to meet him. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was exactly who you would expect the guy who would write books like that to be. Wow. Yeah, it was no charade. It was no public pretense. The guy who wrote those books was the guy he was. He was wow. just uh, one of the most, you know, I just treasure the time that I got to spend with him because he really was just. How did that set up? How, where were you? How did that? How did that come into place? Well, he was a member of the National Speakers Association. Oh, okay, okay. Thing okay. Is me, and so he he walked up to me at a convention and started a conversation. I, I had done a session for the association or something that he had seen, and he walked up and he's having a and. You know, I'm back and forth, and then I'm looking at the badge, and I'm like, oh, my God, I'm talking to Ogmandino. This is who's telling me this. That's crazy. You know? Yeah, and he just it just was a delightful, delightful guy. You know, really, yeah. uh, it was just a joy to 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 spend time with him and, and see who he was as a person. Yeah. 
Wow. You know, and you, I go back, you go back to people not reading, you know, I think what, what we, I mean, we all lived through COVID, but I think when people went to their houses, they went into this, some people, not everyone, but depression and because the we're relationship people, we get energy off of being with people and that's, that's how we're wired. And when you take, take that away from people, they went into, I believe it, negative toxicity, looking at a lot of negativity, comparing themselves with other people on social media and feeling bad about themselves. And, and, you know, the Adderall medication, that one drug, there's a shortage of that drug. And one of the things it's crazy, one of the things that are released that drug has is dopamine. And, and you know what our we have a little it's called the hypothalamus in our brain, that little P shaped thing in our brain that releases dopamine when we exercise feelings of love and and gratitude and we do personal development dopamine's released and serotonin's released in our you know it's so i think we mentally as a society are struggling and that i you know that's that's all that's all i can say is i see it i see where people just like you know the story you talked about you know you know the relationship you were starting i mean that's how people are. They're, 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 they're just not into growing or per, they're just stagnant. And we need to help people wake up and, and wake up their minds, I think, you know, and, and believe that they can have a better life. And, and, and so it's, it's, it's exciting to know uh, that the, these things in our, that are in our brain, it really, our brain has the ability of releasing chemicals to help us be better people, you know, and, and so it's it's pretty neat. <laughs> yeah. So a little bird told me that you were actually a statewide MVP in basketball. So I and I know sports are still a part of you. I know you're a crazy avid golfer. <laughs> what 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 did you learn in sports that that helps you in business and life, I guess I, I would be wondering. Yeah, sports, I think, kept me out of trouble too, obviously, but having an activity like that. But competition is just being competitive. I mean, it's uh, life is competitive, business is competitive. And and just being on a team, working with other people with different strengths, different weaknesses, and trying to win a win a game, you know, with that team and be a better team just created a competitive nature in me and couple that with, you know, the personal development, you know, I'm going to do whatever it takes to win. You know, I want to be, I want to be the best consultant in our company, you know, or I want, you know, really believing that and our, and taking those competitive, you know, you practice, practice, practice sports. I mean, it's nonstop, right? I mean, you spend more time practicing than you do actually, you know, competing in a game and do, doing all year after year practicing, you know, every day, waking up in two a days and 5 a.m. in the morning because you got to get to, you know, two a day practice before and then other before school. And then you got to practice after school. And and so all of those disciplines of of practicing and, and doing the activity necessary so that you can be a winner. Uh, it really does translate into life, you know, and having that competitive nature and having a winning attitude. And that, I mean, and then putting that in, in the golf course as well. I mean, it's such a mental game, you know, and, and our business is so mental. It's crazy the amount of people that we're, we help in our team that are just stuck on little things that really don't matter. You know, I mean, people get stuck up and they want to focus on this little is this little like, okay, I threw the basketball out of bounds, right? Okay, move on. Like you made a mistake. Let's move on and let's win the game. The, the game ain't over, eh? The game is not over. You made a mistake. Big deal. Move on, you know? And so, but I don't know why people like to just stay focused on this little negative thing. And <laughs> it's frustrating, you know? It's like, okay, let's let's focus on what's important here, you know? And you go through and what we have here and all these things and and get them mentally shifted, right? But Again, if they would have been doing personal development, they wouldn't even have needed to call us to ask us that, you know, to, you know, because you can tell when people are calling you for 
certain things that you ain't doing personal development, you know, because it, you, it's not a big deal. This is really a small, minute thing in the big picture. And so um, mistakes are always going to happen and, and really focusing on the activity that's going to make us successful too. And the results always come, you know, it's all, you know, the practice and practice and practice, but prospecting activity, activity, go out there and make mistakes really is what I, I mean, we're, we are professional failures. My wife and I have failed so many times. Do you know, just you, your duplication nation is just incredible because we didn't have that for a big portion of it. We didn't have duplication for many years of our business and just trying to create the system ourselves and and making tons of mistakes and doing things that are not duplicatable um, but really growing and understanding getting back up again through those mistakes you know and being professional at overcoming and getting up you know and learning and growing and and that's that's the heart and soul of what we are because you know you can you can you tell people they can have financial freedom and and, and they really can um, but it, but it really it really starts with their beliefs and their mindset. And, and from there, it can be it, it, there's no limits. And I think one of the questions I wanted to ask you, too, because we we always have this belief, I believe 100 percent that there's no better industry out there. Right. There, I don't think there's a better way for the most people in this world that can have success, whether it's uneducated, whatever we know it's all through the board, whatever color your skin is. Right. We believe that. And I think. The network marketing is the best option for people, but the past experiences and the experiences that people have um, lead them to believe elsewhere, you know, lead them to believe that network marketing. And, and we had, you know, with our Amway experience, I never really made a lot of money. And then the next company we joined went bankrupt. So we were heading down the road as well as network marketing ain't for me it ain't gonna work you know and 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 until you know we 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 made it work with our company but um i think there's thousands of people out there that have that thought and that network marketing isn't for me because of their past experiences and that's why i love what you're doing because you're creating a fresh perspective of you know our industry is real and there's real people with doing the real and really helping people you know and so tell me i want to like to hear a little bit more about you know our industry as far as people are beat up there's people beat up with their industry that's not sugar it right and and how you know what do we need to do how can we help people you know switch that mindset I love that you bring it, bring the discussion to that avenue because I've never believed that people are ignorant, stupid, lazy, entitled. Right. Yeah, there are elements of that everywhere in society. But if you sponsor 100 people, I believe 85 of them at least really do want success and they would really do it if you can show them the path that they should follow, what are the steps that they should take? What are the skills they have to learn? Um, and the two biggest killers of dreams that are, that are happening in our profession, one is the not, the not giving the training. And then the second part would be the toxic dysfunctional culture that is rampant in some segments of the business people who are like like the relationships i was in i was in negative toxic relationships but i didn't know i was in negative toxic relationships because that's all i knew <laughs> i thought that's what relationships are that you have all this fighting and bitching and you know drama and trauma and because that's all i knew my mother was divorced my aunt and uncle got divorced the other aunt and uncle i got divorced my grandmother was divorced from my grandfather my grandfather divorced a couple more women before he found the right one you know everybody in my family was divorced dysfunctional relationship that you know our family motto was we put the fun back in dysfunctional, right? So <laughs> there's that same, um, there's this whole, and you and Bricia know this 
better than most. And I can only I can say that because of the coaching calls that we've done together, where you or her will call me up and say, hey, you know, we've got this person in the organization and they're saying that. We, and I'm like, wait, 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 what did you just say? And, and so, well, you know, they call us and say, listen, we have these five people who could break a rank if everybody would, if all of us leaders would each spend a thousand dollars buying kits underneath them. Right. And then we'll make them break this rank and they'll get the pin and they'll walk across the stage and they'll be, well, because the people who are calling you, telling you that were trained that by somebody who doesn't know the business five years ago, 10 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, right? There's lots of people like that. So what is what is that? It's actually toxic culture. Mm -hmm. It's dysfunctional culture because it creates all these people with imposter syndromes because they reach this rank because five leaders each spent a thousand dollars underneath them and made them this pin. They don't qualify the very next month. They'll never qualify again. They keep getting presented across stage as that rank, you know. And then they another example is would be where they have people get up and say, okay, everybody say the highest amount of money you ever earned in a month at an opportunity meeting. And so they get up and say, well, the most amount of money I ever made was $8,000 a month. But that was the month when everybody qualified them and bought the rank for them. And they really make $1,100 a month. So every week, they do that opportunity presentation. Every week they share that story. Their palms are sweating. They feel guilty. They feel like imposter. They hate it. And so and that's why I say you guys are the example because, you know, Brees and I had a conversation. She's like, listen, you're going to go be working with our team there. Can you help us blow up this negative culture? Because the whole team there has been told that this is the way to build. Right. And of course, you know, I remember going and doing the event for those people when I said, OK, this bit where we're going to stand up at the meeting, everybody's going to say the amount of income, the highest amount they ever earned in one month, that shit stops right now. It's never going to happen again. I talked to Angelo and Bricia. They don't want that in their team. It's done. <laughs> so I get a standing ovation. <laughs> right. And after, you know, at the break, I have people coming up to me with tears in their eyes. I'm like, oh, my God, you have no idea. I feel so guilty every month doing that or every week doing that. My palms would be sweating when we get to that part of the meeting. Yeah. I just feel, right, there's so much of that. It's just dysfunctional culture, which, like, buy-in leaders. Mm -hmm. Hey. Yeah. There's this guy, an ABC company, he's making 15000 a month. Let's go steal him. We'll make him a deal. We'll give him a payment. Then he'll bring all his people over here. So you have all these MLM zombies who are now just going from company to company to company looking for deals. They blow up the culture everywhere they go. So that's a big, that, that's half of it, I think, Angela, is, is, they're just, they are taught things that are harmful for their business. The, even again, going back to your company, right? <laughs> when I look at it and I, uh, you know, and I, I design compensation plans for a living. <laughs> this is what I do. Okay. I can break down any plan in the world and say, okay, here's how you're going to get the best results in this plan and earn the, you know, the highest legal, moral, ethical amount of money. And the number of people in your company who were fed a story years ago on how to structure their team that they're just losing money. I had a huge team in a, a, a group in Jewel Way who brought me uh, many years ago, like 20 years ago or 15 years ago, or I don't know, a long time ago, uh, a group of like seven diamonds with their company. And they had a stair-step breakaway plan, just like Amway, same kind of structure, Amway, Shackley, New Skin. Those are stair-step breakaway plans for people who are into that kind of thing. 
But with the stair step breakaway program, you would never give away a personal enrollment. It's just, it's career suicide. If somebody really does develop into a leader, if you've given away that enrollment, it might cost you $30,000 a month, every month for the rest of your life. And it, again, and it creates a dysfunctional culture because if you give people, the, you know, if you create the culture where we say, okay, your sponsor is going to give you four people or six people and they're going to force you to qualify for this, yeah. you know, benchmark rank, and then you should do the thing. Well, of course that will break down because most people will not do that. And then you create an entitlement culture. People are calling you, hey, Angelo. What are you doing this month? Last month, you put five people under me. This month, you haven't put anybody. Are you on vacation or something? You know, get your ass to work. Please. You know, <laughs> How am I supposed to get rich if you're not putting people underneath me? All right. It's negative, toxic, dysfunctional culture. And it's being propagated because people think they're doing the right thing. They think they're helping those teammates and they're actually harming them. Because they do destroy the the whole concept of meritocracy and free enterprise and personal responsibility, which are the engines that drive our business. And then, so that's half of it, I think. And then the other half of it is there, where people are not doing real training. They're not teaching skill sets, mm -hmm. right? You go to... It's supposed to be a training event. And somebody puts up their PowerPoint and they go through 57 PowerPoints. And it's pictures of eagles soaring and seagulls soaring and people on mountains, you know, showing, you know, dramatic poses and lots and lots and lots of quotes. Henry Ford said this, Buddha said that, Jesus said this, Martin Luther King Jr. said this, you know, Zig Ziglar said this, and, you know, here's a picture of the, uh, you know, uh, 1976 AMC Pacer that I had that was rusting away, and here's a picture of my new Lamborghini now, and Here's a picture of my one bedroom apartment that the me and the 27 kids lived in. And now here's a picture of my mansion. Now I did it and you can do it too. There's so much of that rah, rah bullshit. And nobody's saying, well, here's how you should work a candidate list. Here's how to prioritize the candidates that you want to focus on to launch your business. Hey, one of the most important skill sets in, you could ever develop is inviting. Mm. How to make a compelling invitation to sample a product, to watch a video, to come to a home meeting, to watch a live stream, to come to an opportunity meeting at the JW Marriott. Inviting, this is, right? There's, there's just, there's people who are and there and then so that leader says well my people are ignorant my people are so lazy why don't my people do it well because you're not teaching them how to do it you're getting up and you say these products they just sell themselves mm -hmm. just think about people you know who could use products like these or you know there's there's no i in team teamwork makes the dream work and, you know, blah, 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 motivational cliche and platitude after platitude. No, at some point, you've that, inf that inspiration stuff is important. We all need it. Absolutely, that's got to be part of the menu. But where's the meat and potatoes? How to meet people, work a candidate list, inviting, presenting, follow-up managing events how do you do a testimonial how do you do monthly counseling with your people yep. what are the key metrics of your organization that you need to track number of distributors number of lines um, leadership ranks people who qualify at ranks average volume of the team an average number of customers per distributor right 
These are, this is what real entrepreneurs with real businesses do. And the people in our profession who make it well and succeed, they are real entrepreneurs who run it like a real business. And, but that real business is the result of learning skill sets. And, you know, I always say that the definition of leadership, of empowering leadership, is to inspire people to become the highest possible version of themselves. Just the first half, everybody buys into that, but they forget the second half, half, which is, and create the infrastructure that makes that possible. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have the major events, if you don't have the super Saturday trainings or the, you know, uh, Monday night leadership academy, or, you know, if you don't have that infrastructure that does the training and, and shows them, you know, if you take, a guy like me, who was a waiter and a cook and a whatever, and you want me to run a multi-million dollar business, you better teach me something about time management. You better teach me something about productivity. You better teach me something about managing a business, right? Yeah. And yeah. those two areas, I think, I'm really glad you 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 brought that up that, you know, those two channels, I think are the problem, but I, I'd love to hear what you think, you know, where, where, where do you see the, the chinks in the armor there? Um, you know, I think it's, those two things are, are probably the heart, heart and soul of where, where we're at too. I, I think all of the lately, it's a lot of the, the money games that are out there for people and, and, People have been told I, I, what I see when I when people come, you know, to our, in our company and they tell me what's happened to them. Uh, a lot of it is false expectations by their their upline. They're given uh, basically, I mean, in a nutshell, they're lied to to get signed up and then they disappear. Uh, and they've had a, they've had a couple of those experiences where they were told that they were going to just sign up here and you're going to be wealthy and just give me your money and it's going to work. And, and so that type of thinking, um, people are scared, you know, they're, they have, they're very hesitant and they're unsure and they're skeptical. Uh, and so we have to do our job, you know, and, and say, no, you're, you're, well, you know what, you're not going to get rich quick. Maybe, I mean, it is possible, but that's not what I'm telling you. You know, I'm telling you, this is the program here. This is, you're going to see results here like never before, but these are the things you got to be willing to do. You're going to have to work. But why are you going to do these things? Well, that's so you can have a lifestyle like nobody has. And that's what our industry can offer is I was just at the, I just took my son to a golf tournament yesterday. He finished his, his home, his school here. And, and we went to a golf tournament and I was talking to the guy and said, yeah, I'm going, we're, we're planning a trip to Europe for, for a month, you know, coming up this summer. And he, he couldn't like, I'm used to just having the, a free lifestyle, you know, and, but when you tell people that it's like, I didn't, I just realized this yesterday. It's like, wait a, a month, like, what the heck do you do where you can leave a month and you have four kids? Like, you know, and so I created a way to prospect, you know, and be able to connect with him and, and, you know, sit down with him and get to know him more and all that, you know, but you know, when, when, when you have, it's, People don't have a free lifestyle out there. And it's for me, having it for eight and a half years, it, you just get used to it. You get used to just going and doing what you want to do. Uh, but that's not the reality for people. And so uh, it's it's important that we show people the system and what they need to do, how they, how to, I mean, if you can learn, just like you said, if you can learn how to invite I mean, that's huge. That That's a skill that just is repetitive and you can have a huge organization. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's important that we don't, I think for everyone that's listening, you know, not to give people false expectations and manage those expectations and manage. Okay. Well, yeah, you, okay. You're going to, you're going to make 10 grand in, in a year. Well, how much time, how much actual time are you going to be able to spend? Well, I don't, I only have an hour a day. Okay. Well, let's, 
you know, okay, you can take that, take that hour a day. What are we going to do during that hour? Break it down. Okay. You're going to do most of that time, you know, needs to be spent in prospecting, inviting and follow up, showing the business plan, right? That's the heart and soul. And so you can have a very big business with one hour a day, but it's going to take time and you're going to have to learn. And it's, and, and we're going to go on this journey together. And, and so, but you know, if you just, if that person with an hour and day say, I want to make five grand this month, well, let's, <laughs> You, so it takes the quite we we as the upline need to be the ones asking the questions. You know how much time do you have and and all those things and managing those expectations. That's what I've seen and people just being burnt. You know, burnt with bad deals and and their upline. You know, the, the, they changed the product, they changed the compensation plan. My upline did this, that, or whatever the things are. You know, and so us as upline treating people right, being you know loving on people and treating them right is is huge. And caring and being honest, right? I mean, honesty is huge because people are buying in. When they buy into your to our company, they're they're buying into us and they're trusting us. They're giving us their trust, and and so you can either burn it or or harness that and and build a relationship and and help people get on the right path. So um, it's 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 quite the journey, and there's no, you know, there's no other industry like this. It's so fun and unique that. We can help people, you know, grow and we can help people have a better life with their financing, finances or whatever other products that we have. So it's pretty exciting. There's no greater industry out there. There's nothing better out there. It's just exciting that we are in this space, which is offered. We can help people have the most amazing lifestyle if, you know, if they do the necessary steps. There's nothing else like this. It's exciting. It really is. And, and I've made money in a, a, a number of, you know, I'm a pretty successful entrepreneur now with a lot of different um, ventures, but none of them could, none of them could have happened or would have happened if it wasn't for direct selling. Yeah. Um, because I was a high school dropout who was, you know, literally thrown out of high school. So not really dropped out technically, right? <laughs> Who, you know, worked his way up as a minimum wage dishwasher coming from a very uh, single mother, raising three kids, poor family, no education. My kid's sister is the first person ever in my family who attended a college. And um, that wasn't going to happen in any other business. It just, because self-development is baked in the cake in our profession, that's what allowed me to grow so I can be successful in these other ventures now and running a media company, right? Um, I'm able to do that now because of the skills I developed in direct selling, because of the belief I developed, because of the wisdom and the experience that I got being in the business. Uh, we work with an all-volunteer army, and that is such a distinction versus other fields. Um, as I worked my way up to the restaurant and you know became a, a restaurant manager, right? Now I got to wear a tie. I had this really big roll of keys. And so obviously I was really important because of the number of keys on my keychain. And I tell the dishwasher, you got to mop the floor before you, you know, and if he didn't mop the floor, I fired him, right? And then you hire someone and they don't do it, you fire him. Well, we don't get to hire and fire people in our business, man. You've got to inspire them to want to be there. And you've got to keep them believing in themselves long enough until they can get that initial victory. Uh, you know, as I talk about in the first circle book, you know, we've got to get them from hope to belief. Hope gets people in the business. Belief keeps people in the business. And it's all about keeping them in long enough till that self-belief gets there. And because it's a side gig for most people, because they already have a, a you know, a paycheck they're getting anyway, because this is direct conflict with their bowling night, their softball night, their um, Game of Thrones night, their, uh, you know, whatever, Chicago Med, Chicago PD, Chicago whatever night. They're, <laughs> it's so easy for them to quit. And we have to show them 
um, that freedom comes from discipline. And I, I, the issue that you raised, this is what I think all of us have to do a better job of. You know, when everybody's zigging, you want to be zagging. So right now, everybody's zigging like, hey, you can be an Instagram influencer and you can make $200,000 a year just doing bo unboxing videos and you can endorse, you can create your own t-shirts and your swag and you can get a YouTube channel and you can join this Forex deal and make $20,000 your first month and you can join this MLM crypto scam and 300% guaranteed on your money and we have to say, and when they say, yeah, but I heard I can go with the Go Global and I can make $20,000 my first month. You have to say, why would you waste a whole month to earn $20,000? Why don't you just go rob a bank and you could do it in 20 minutes? And they're like, well, I would never go rob a bank. I have morals. Okay, well, if you have morals, then you shouldn't be in an MLM crypto scam either. So I'm not going to promise you $20,000 your first month. I'm not going to promise you anything your first month. I'm going to promise you that whatever you make for the entire first year, you should reinvest it back in your business. Mm -hmm. And wow. you keep your job, you keep your paycheck, and everything you make, you reinvest it in your business or you invest it in lowering your debt. And this is a two to four year plan or a two to five year plan. And I want at least 10 hours a week yep. outside of your job. I, I need you to devote 10, 12 hours a week to your new business. And just don't look left. Don't look right. You just swim in your lane for the first year. And then you and I sit down after one year and let's have an evaluation. And then if you tell me I have done this for, for one year, I've put in my 10 hours a week and I don't see the results, then I won't argue with you. But I believe if we do it right, and I know if we do it right at the end of the year, they will stay in because they will have seen the value. Yeah. So. Let me. Yeah, you know, that's a great point. I think when we look back at our, you know, our story with our business, you know, it was really formulated of 90 day intense work periods where we, yes, we were doing a lifestyle of, of recruiting and prospecting, but it was those periods of intense work where we saw like incredible results where it was like eight to 16 hours. This is that this is for more higher level leaders that are already, you know, maybe making five to ten thousand dollars a month. What do you do next to scale it? And it's and, and so we really went to this this program of 90 days. You don't do anything else. You you live, sleep and that's what you do. You're focused on the money maker activities, which you know are the prospecting, inviting, showing the business plan, take you know events, and and follow up and all that. So those periods of time have taken us really to where we are today to be able to be financially free and with a stable business. And those are the real. I mean, that's the that's the that's the heart and soul of our industry. You know, to 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 be able to not only build it once for a year, but really to build a sustainable team for many, many years. And that's, I think, what, what everybody wants. You know, nobody wants to build a company and then have to redo it again. I mean, that that's not fun. But, you know, I think the, the our industry offered, there's so many good companies out there that our industry offers that and focus and don't get sidetracked with it's just like another deal, another deal comes, another deal goes and people go, they just run towards that and they run toward it and then they run and then they're, you know, there's nothing sustainable. And so it's, it's about helping people understand that this is, this is not a short term, quick make a buck and get out of there. No, this is a long term situation. And that's what I, I think we need more of these people to step up and, and say this message because it's a long term you know, legacy that we can pass down to, to our kids. And, and so it's, it's, uh, it's exciting. And so I, you know, the, 
from an industry perspective, I was just, you know, the other day looking at the direct sale and the, the numbers and that just as just specifically U.S. I mean, when I look at all industries across the board, I, I did take notes here. I wanted to see what you thought of this. But from 2010 to like 2015-ish, 2010, they were doing a network marketing in the U.S., um, 28 billion. And then in 2015, it went to 36 billion and it was stable up until 2019. It went to, you know, from 36 to 42 billion in the US. I mean, it's this, it, I mean, there, every industry has up and downs. But when I looked at the graph of network marketing from 2010, there was, it was, there was a stable period, but it never really had a decrease. And then in 2019, it just shot up to six billion dollars from 2019 and through the 2021 and so i wanted to ask your perspective on that why why network marketing as an industry there isn't really it it doesn't doesn't go down i mean it really i mean there there are times there's recessions and maybe that's an exception maybe they're you know in 2008 and in 2000 it probably did but maybe it did i mean i just saw from 2010 to where we are today there, it just it kept going, and so it's interesting. It was interesting for me, and just to really think that we are in a, a really an incredible industry. The the markets we're in because we're in everything, right? There is send out cards, which is the Jordan Adler show that people could see. We just did of mailing out cards to um, cleaning products companies to household products like uh, Melaleuca, let's say, to utilities like Utilities Warehouse in the U.S. And of course, all the cosmetic and companies and skincare companies and nutritional and wellness companies. But I mean, it's such a broad spectrum. But the vast majority of those product lines, and I mean, overwhelming majority, like 89.2674% are transfer buying stuff, necessity stuff, stuff you're going to buy every day. I was sitting in a a subway with uh, Dan Higginson, who's the, I don't know his title. I think he's president of Synergy USA or something. And we were talking about Melaleuca. And he said, you know, they claim they have the people buying the same product for 27 years. I don't know if I believe that. And I said, well, you know, I'm like, I don't know how old I was then, 60, let's say, or 55 or whatever. I'm like, as far as I know, my mom always bought Zest soap. So when I moved out of the house, I've been buying Zest soap. And as far as I know, I've been buying Zest soap for about 50 years. <laughs> And he laughed and he said, oh, my God, that's so funny. I've been using Zest soap my whole life. And his younger brother, Scotty, was there and said, oh, my God, yes, we use Zest soap in our house, too. We've never used because obviously the Higginson's mother used Zest soap. And that's what happens. So we have a lot of products like that, that once people, I, you know, and, and so to Dan, you know, Dan said, oh, well, OK, maybe it's true. Melaleuca, I'm, maybe I'm being too hard on him. That's true. That does happen, that kind of brand loyalty. And so even in the worst economic times, most women are still going to buy makeup foundation or makeup remover or eyelash stuff and most people who you, the people who use skincare are going to keep using it the people who buy energy drinks and energy bars they're going to keep buying energy drinks and energy bars and if you're using um you know amway what is it a8 what's the laundry soap S- sa8 SA8. If you're using SA8, it doesn't matter what happens in the Middle East or the war in Ukraine or the stock market index or the worldwide recession, you're still going to keep washing your clothes, mm-hmm. right? So the, the Shackleys, the Amways, the Herbalites, the New Skins, the Naturas, the Fusion, the Immunitech, you know, all, all the companies. If, if That's why I think the profession... And we are counter cyclical in the sense, usually when the economy is doing bad, our business, the recruiting really goes up. 
And then when the when the economy is doing great, the recruiting goes down. But the the companies that are smart enough to have built a sales base of satisfied customers, that's that doesn't matter. That doesn't you know up and down. Right. And the thing, even with growth, we, you know, we all have those those PowerPoint slides that show the exponential growth curve, right? And here is the company. But the truth is, no team and no company actually has a straight line like that. Yeah. The line is zigzag, and hopefully the hires keep getting higher and the lows keep getting, they're less low, you know, and over the course of time, the overall trajectory is up. And if you go back to 1956, when Dr. Forrest Shackley started what became Shackley and DeVos and Van Andel started what became Amway in 59, and you look at the trajectory of network marketing, it is absolutely up and is going to continue to go up because, you know, we've got an assent- this incredible business model where we are delivering products and services that provide real value because the ones that don't, they get shaken out. Right. Like in the show I did with Jordan Adler, anyone who didn't, which you couldn't have seen yet because it's not up yet, but by the time people watch this, it'll be posted. I mean, we talked about those Forex deals and the guys who, you know, they've been in the business for a year and they're already making $30,000 a month, but they won't be in that deal four months from now because that deal will be gone, right? And if you had the opportunity to, you know, make $30,000 a month in your first MLM crypto token deal, you know, in your first year, or you could be making $3,000 a year with Shackley or, mm-hmm. you know, Herbalife or Mary Kay or Natura or what, Omniframe, Omniflame, or a flame. Take those because they're going to be here next year. And if you're making 5000 with them this year, you might be making. 15,000 a month with them by the end of the next year. And and 10 years from now, you might be making 75,000 a month. And 20 years from now, you still be making money with those. Whereas, you know, like I said, you can always rob banks, you know, do, you know, minute by minute, I still think bank robbery is the best, uh, highest paid income, but it has a terrible retirement plan. I mean, <laughs> Just terrible retirement plan because you're going to end up in prison or dead. There is no other option at the end of that. And here's so that's kind of a you know lighthearted way to look at it. But here's the serious side of this that I was talking about with Jordan: the lives that are being destroyed by these crypto scams and Ponzi schemes right now, and you know, because you're working in those markets, the, the, the worst affected markets right now are Latin America. Because people, they're, they're, people are so poor there, the allure of this go global and CIFRA and one coin, the, the sophistication level of the business isn't advanced enough there. The education level isn't high enough yet. The poverty is so, you know, overpowering. If you live in San Salvador, you know, if you could make $500 a month with any company, you live like a king. So when you have these crypto scammers coming in with their Lamborghini private jet, you know, mansion, recruiting platform and videos and stuff. It's so intoxicating. And there, people are losing their houses. They're, I mean, when, you know, I, again, watch the show with Jordan Adler, if you haven't, where we talked about the people who are being kidnapped and tortured and the, the involvement of crime, you know, organized crime 
this guy Reynoso was just, you know, at the time I'm recording this with you, maybe it was four or five weeks ago, he was just arrested in Mexico City. He's a narco trafficker in a cartel. But he's a big promoter of Omega Pro, which is now go, go, go global. I mean, he was doing all the videos and the recruiting and, you know, these thousands of poor young people who are getting sucked into this thing, these things. And then they're like, you know, even, even in markets like the UK or the US or other developed markets, they're still like, hey, Angelo, you know, how much is your house worth? It's worth 300,000. How much is your mortgage? Oh, you only have 180,000 on your mortgage. So you have room on your mortgage. If you got a second mortgage and you take out $75,000, you put it with us. Remember, we guarantee 300% a month. You know, imagine and lives are being destroyed. Yeah. And it's the same a lot of it's the same owner CEO that the one deal gets shut down and somehow he's able to spin up another thing. And even the people know it too. I mean, people see, oh yeah, that was that company, <laughs> that guy was in jail for six months and that's the same guy that's doing this one. And some people just, I don't know that some people don't care. It's some, some, some like, oh, okay. You know, but I, I'm just, it's just dumbfounding to me what what that way of thinking, how people don't, some people, not everyone, obviously, there are, there's a lot of people that won't, but they follow the carrot, even though if they have to compromise their ethics, you know, and, and, and that's what really gets me, you know, more passionate about what we need to be doing and what you're doing is, is just awesome because that's, it's, it's, a, it's the, it's the good part of what we are. It's the, and that's the, that's the hope is that enough people can see the good in this industry and we can be the advocates of, of doing things the right way and, and building a solid, sustainable business over a period of time that can have, you know, with the products that can help people, obviously. And so, um, you know, I think, I think it's, it's more and more of this uh, every, you know, every new, there's always new things that are coming, you know, there's always the new, you know, I remember you created that, that presentation of the bottle rocket companies that go up, but they come down just as fast, you know, and, and so that's, that's what we, you know, need to come against and, and uh, help people see there's real life opportunities out there. And, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's good to, it's good to be doing this with you. And I hopefully our message can get out there to, to people. Yeah, you know what? For you guys watching or listening right now, I'm telling you, you have to do the leaders. If you're a leader, and here we are, what, an uh, hour and 45 minutes into this. If you're still watching it, you're a leader because lead, leaders are the ones who watch. It doesn't matter if these are three hours long, five hours long. They watch every episode every week. They just put it on their podcast and they do it cardio in the gym or whatever. So, um, at this point, if you're a leader, if you're not a subscriber of MLM Confidential, you need to pause this right now. Go to MLMconfidential.com or if habla uh, espanol, MLMconfidential.com and get a subscription because we have a segment every month called The Dish. And we alert you to these scams and these exactly what you said, Angelo. It's like, wait a minute. This is the guy who was in prison four years ago. He got out two years ago. He started this token scam, that crash. Now he's opening a new one. And you know, so we name names and we name the company. And we because I believe then you can inoculate your distributors over them. Like, you know, one of the people we've been tracking is this guy, Mike Sims. And then when Omega Pro became Go Global and we're like, OK, they're saying this is not Omega Pro. But if we look at who registered the website, if we look at the corporate officers, this yep. is still the same cast of criminals. Yep. And as we reported in MLM Confidential, 
you know, we because we also have like a Telegram channel and a private Facebook group. So we post immediately when there's stuff like this. So this Mike Sims guy is now actually cooperating with authorities. He's not allowed to do any trading, any investment, any anything. They've seized all his laptop, cell phone, everything. He's turning evidence. And there should be a lot of people who are very nervous right now because there's going to be a lot of people going to prison, right? So we are doing that. So if you're a leader, you need to be a, it's very inexpensive, but it's a leadership resource that everyone should have. So I, I need to take a, you know, a minute and and put a promo for that because people really, you know, it, it's astounding to me that, how these people can just keep reinventing new scams and nobody and, and you know the other thing that you brought up is the really terrible part of it all is the people who know yeah they just you know and i've had people that i say you know they call me and they pitch me on something and and i'm like you know this is a pyramid right you know this is a money game. Yeah, I know, but you know, it's I, I just want to do it for two years. If I can make five million bucks, and then I'll go out and I'll be, and I'm like, really, really. I mean, what yeah, else can you say? Just to not not even care about the people's lives involved, and just to, to really, really put money as the only thing that's important. That's really what's happening. The only thing that matters in life is money. And I don't care about the people I'm going to destroy. I just want to make a ton of money and I don't care how it's done. I mean, the bank robber story, that's just basically what it is. But, you know, and, and I think there, there, there's, a, there, there's more good out there than there is that. And I think that's, that's the, the hope that we have, you know, and I think we can, that's going to, just like many companies in the past have come and gone, I think these are they're going to come and go and people are going to see and we're going to we're going to have the biggest growth our industry has seen i really believe that in these coming coming years and uh it's you know people are going to be fed up with that but they still they, they the reality is people do need to find a home you know they need they, they do need to and they need that they need to find a real opportunity and so we're going to have the biggest growth i think industry-wide you know moving forward here and so it's it's exciting people are digitally more digitally savvy to build their business but they also are seeing the importance of relationships too and and so we gotta we're, we're at we're at the sweet it's, it's an exciting time to be alive in our space right now really and, and so it's it's good it's it's very good um so randy what tell me I, I you know i i know you're i know a little bit about your your story but i i want to know um more so like can you dig in a little bit about when you were what you saw your mother doing when you were growing up? How did you see her live a life? Because I had two parents, you know, and so I they both were working and raising our kids, but you you didn't. And I want to I want to hear you know kind of that aspect of how how you grew up and and where that led you. Yeah, so um, she was an Avon lady back when Avon ladies went out and knocked on doors which you just you couldn't do that today right i mean literally literally yesterday on my phone there was some alert about somebody went to pick up their kids and they pulled in the wrong driveway and the guy came out and and, and they realized and they were backing out and the guy the homeowner came out and shot him right this so could you imagine if an avon lady went to knock on his door I mean, good God. <clears throat> so, but back then, Madison, Wisconsin, you could do that. And she raised three kids by herself doing that. I hated it at the time. I hated being poor. We always had some old beat up station wagon. Um, we never took, the, you know, the the vacation what our vacation was every year was a drive to the Tommy Bartlett water ski show in okay. where was that again? You remember what are that Wisconsin lake? Wisconsin Dells. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Dells. Wisconsin Dells. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, so maybe it's a day trip there. That was a vacation. And I had kids I went to school with and they went to France for two weeks or they went to Italy or they went to Africa. And I'm like, oh, my God. And, you know, they had new Schwinn 10-speed bicycles. And I had this old broken down hand-me-down from my brother. And, you know, they, you know, they was maybe by the time I was in my teens, um, Edwin jeans were the bomb, man. So the kids at school had Edwin jeans and I had JC Penny jeans. And I just hated that, you know, so... I shared a bedroom with my brother. My sister shared a bedroom with my mother. The four of us shared one bathroom. I had friends that there was four kids in the family and they had four bedrooms. They each had their own bedroom. I'm like, oh my God, this would be so amazing. Now, why did I get born in this broke family? You know, so I, 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 I hated it. And so one of the things I had to do was to help my mother was go and put Avon books on doors in all of the apartment How buildings. You did that? How old were you when you did that? Uh, I was probably 11, 10, 11, 12, something like that. Um, and so you, I would go and put books on the doors of this many buildings on Monday. And then, and it had a little note, uh, you know, sticker from her that said, hey, look this over. I'll be by tomorrow to see if you'd like to order anything. And then on Tuesday, she would go and, and then on, you know, yeah. Tuesday, I'd be doing a new series of buildings or my brother would be doing a new series of buildings. And I mean, that taught me such a great lesson about, you know, but again, at the time, I didn't recognize any of this. I hated this reality. But, oh, man, when I look back on it and, you know, like when I talk about, you know, being an addict and, and, and hurting people in ways I could never, um, you know, repay. I just think of my mother as, as so hard she worked to raise the three of us. And, you know, she would I think of the night she got the call at 3 a.m. to say, hey, we have your son in jail. You know, we just arrested him for armed robbery. You need to come down and fill out a report. I mean, the kind of things I put <laughs> that poor woman through. Um, that's why in the uh, in the direct selling success book, I you know, I tell the story of I called her. She wasn't there. So I left a message on the voicemail and I said, Mrs. Gage, I just want to let you know that your son is on his way to have lunch with the president of the United States of America. Wow. And I hung up, you know, just to, you know, reward, you know, and this picture I have here, I have a second one, which I sent her. And she put up in her living room or dining, I guess it's in the dining room. And, you know, my sister is telling, oh, man, everybody who comes to the house, she takes them and shows the picture of you with the president. I'm like, God, I hope I, I hope I've done something to give yeah. her pride in me, something that to, you know, pay her back yeah. for what she went through um, raising me. Because, um, you know, it's just. But the lessons of being, you know, being an entrepreneur, because an Avon lady is an entrepreneur, right? Yeah. Today, it's a lot easier, right? If you're an Avon rep or a Natura rep, you have a catalog, you probably work in an office, you give the catalog to the 10 people you work with and you take their order and it's, you put it on the computer or they order direct and it's delivered direct and, you know, you're not schlepping products or anything. But back then it was all of that schlepping, which then the orders would come and she would, we would have to help her bag them up and then she would go and deliver the orders to each people. But man, that the experience that that gave me was so invaluable, so invaluable. Wow. And the story of overcoming to just being able to overcome and make, make an amazing life out of that. And that it just gives, it gives so many people hope, you know, to that it doesn't matter our backgrounds or where we come from. 
you know, you can, you can make something, make something out of nothing. And you, it's, it's that's the, the work ethic, I'm sure watching her work ethic, but probably instilled in you, you know, uh, very intense work ethic as well, which, you know, anything, I'm sure anything you would have done, you would have been successful. Obviously you found network marketing and have the lifestyle that people dream of, you know, but I think it's the work ethic going back to work. You know, I always, you know, there, there's, there, you, we're here and there's, a success over here and there's a bridge well that bridge is hard work i mean really you know and and i think that's what your mother probably instilled in you more than anything watching her work hard for i mean i can't imagine i'm married with four kids we work together you know but i just it's hard for me to imagine a single mother with three kids and just making it work i mean it, it it's it's an, it's pretty crazy and hats off to your mom <laughs> yeah and if I break it down, I still to this day believe perhaps the greatest gift I ever received in life was being born poor. Sure. And because and and hating being poor. It's like, you know, you watch um one of these interview shows and they have some celebrity and they're like, you know, we were we were so poor, but we didn't even know it. Our house was so filled with love. And I watched that and I said, who the hell are you kidding? You're telling me you didn't know you were poor. I knew I was poor and I hated knowing it being poor, right? And yeah. because I hated being poor, I learned, hey, when they do a snow day and schools are closed because we got 18 inches of snow, I got... 25 neighbors who need their sidewalk shoveled and their driveways shoveled and wow. I can make some money and I'll get a paper route with the capital times and I'll deliver newspapers and I will babysit. I will rake leaves. I will shovel snow. I will mow lawns because I want Edwin jeans. I want a Schwinn 10 speed. I want to have a car when I'm old enough to drive. Right. And so that, that, you know, and then, you know, no, people are going to hate when I say this, but I, you know, I learned a great deal. I made my way through middle school selling dope. So I became a very successful uh, marijuana dealer back when all this stuff was illegal. And that was amazing business that taught me how to be an entrepreneur, sure. right? Yeah. Um, so Th there is gifts and there's lessons and there's hidden blessings in everything if we're mindful enough to look for them and we're you know willing to learn the lessons that they offer us yeah we i mean that's a similar not probably not as broke as as you but we you know we didn't have much art my the one vacation that we took i remember i was seven years old and it was a it was a camping trip around lake superior it was a uh -huh. A old woody station wagon the three of us were in the back seat and it was a three-week trip around lake superior because that was all the money that we had but it was uh, the one trip that i'll never forget either you know and and so <laughs> it was uh very humble beginnings as well and my parents you know they 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 worked their amway business on the side and you know missed a lot of my basketball games growing up because they were they were building their business and um planting those seeds and, and believing in it and um in the end you know they were on four, you know 12 12 years in amway and just never able to it's sad you know it's just they never were able to get a lot of traction financially and um so but all those seeds that were planted you know and those books that that we read i still you know we still believed in the industry and so when I married Bricia, she didn't know anything about network marketing. You know, I took her and took her to who I was still because, you know, I was I was going to all the meetings, spending the money and doing all these things. And she comes in and and says, OK, you're how long have you been in, you know, working on this Amway deal? I said, well, it was eight years. And she's like, well, how much are you spending and how much time are you putting in? And she basically just said, you know, that's that's a hobby. We need to look for another opportunity, you know, <laughs> a good, nice hobby. If it was maybe a year or two, maybe, I could, you know, keep trying. But it was eight years and I just couldn't have the income that that we wanted. And so um, 
I had I was running a valet parking business, the, the valet parking business that I was working in college because I need you know, I was I was trying to I was playing college basketball. I was in school debt, student debt. I you know it was it's what we had, and my parents weren't able to help me with with, with school, but I wanted to go, and so took out these student loans and was valet parking as much as I could and trying to play basketball and study and all that. And and this goes back to belief and attitude. Once once I got back from Switzerland, I'm sitting there. I'm like, what in the world am I going to do? I went back and valet parked. I was parking cars again, 40 hours a week out there parking cars. And because of my attitude and beliefs, the owner of that valet company asked me to take over that company and run the and be the owner because he was about 65 running to retire. So I bought that business from him and he told me. You can have a six month period where you don't have to pay me anything, get the cash flow going. And then, you know, once that goes, you can pay me 13% of the gross revenue until this loan's paid off. So that taught me a ton, you know, being able to. Amazing. Amazing. It it was just, uh, it was was incredible. And bringing, implementing, uh, that was kind of the period of things were going online, getting online, all these different things that go into running a business people calling in sick and I'm going to have to go out there and park cars. So I was thinking when I took over that business that I was going to be, that was my way to be financially free. This valet, I want to grow this valet business, but two and a half years into it, we had grown and, and it really became the owner of me. I just, I was a slave to that. I worked hard. We made, it was good. It was great because it was making good money, but also you go back to lifestyle, right? And so I still had this thing in my mind about network marketing has the greatest lifestyle, we, you know, and, mm-hmm. and so we, <laughs> we, we get, you know, get involved with, with uh, another company that ends up going bankrupt on us. And we were, I was sure the dreams were going to come true through this deal. And, it, you know, we were, we were sure of it and it didn't work. And so then I went in, you know, into the car business and started selling because we, from this valet business, I'm like, okay, I'm going to leave that up and some, I'm, I'm not going to run that business. I put it in someone else's hands. They were running the business. We moved to Texas and this company goes bankrupt. And so I'm sitting there. What are we going to do? I started selling cars, got into the car, fell in love with the car business and sold sometimes 28 to 30 cars a month, became finance manager, sales manager, all because of a good attitude, treating, I mean, in anything you do in life, treat people right, right? I mean, I wasn't a scammy salesman guy. Just treat people right. This is the deal. And and um, it was a lot of fun, you know, and and but still, again, no lifestyle, you know, it was, it was 50, 60, 70 hours a week. And and so, you know, finally, with with our with our company now, we've been 12 years and and been able to have a, a wonderful lifestyle. And, and so there is hope out there. There's there's good there's good people out there. And uh, it's it's exciting to see all of those seeds that were planted from my parents and what they did, you know, back then, I saw that I saw, I, you know, this is a probably a a good lesson for people, but I saw my dad drive three hours for a meeting. And it was a no show. And he missed my basketball game because it was a no show. And but he had a, he maintained a good attitude and believed, you know, and and that's the that's the the t- the mental toughness that I think people need to have is is, is just be, becoming a mentally tough person. And people are always going to say no, you know. And you're, but I I just saw him, you know, in in Wisconsin. You you I mean, we lived out in the country, so we had to he had to go to the city sometimes, you know. So it was a it was a drive for him, and he would go and have. Um, Sometimes there would be people there, but I just remember a lot of no-shows, you know, and it was sad. It was sad for me to see my parents giving up so much of their life for and believing in something, you know, and and they and and my my point to all that is is it's possible because all those seeds that were planted, I believe they came to fruition fruition in our life. And and so it does work and it's it's exciting to to be a part of this industry. And and now is the fact that I'm sitting near talking to you, Randy. You know, all the you know, you've had all these 40 years of ex- more than 40, 50 years of experience with with what you've dealt with with your mom. And now where you are today, the blessing of being able to be here sharing with you. It's like, you know, 
in sports, you know, when you you work, 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 and I, I'll relate it to golf, but I see these young golfers that are professional athletes. They're watching Tiger Woods on TV when they were kids. And now they're there playing with him and they can't believe it. And I feel like that right now, you know, I've, I'm built my, we built our business, you know, and now here I am here, hanging out with Randy Gage on a zoom. So it's, it's pretty incredible to, to think where things were, the process to get and where they are today and not only where they are today, but I think where things, you know, are moving, moving down the road. So I, very thankful for you and and inviting me and my wife to this and i think we're going to do big things together you know keep, we keep close relationship we can, we can have a lot of fun together listen i want to reposition one thing i believe your parents did amway for 12 years and that was the most successful business venture they could have ever ever done True. That's true. Because that is why you were reading those books at 15 years old. What what greater accomplishment could a parent ever get than to raise a child who grows up to contribute to the world in a meaningful way? And you did that because your dad drove three hours to from Stevens Point, Wisconsin, to you know wherever <laughs> Kenosha or wherever Green Bay, and yeah. <laughs> Green Bay, and nobody showed up, and he turned around and drove three hours back. The work ethic, the belief, the introduction to self development, the fact that now you have been able to take the lessons that they began and you have applied them with Bricia. You guys are the top people in your company. You inspire everybody in that company looks up to you guys and the work that you do. Um, and that's because your mom and dad showed the plan and unpacked the boxes and went, you, you know, tried to become direct and have all the product in their garage and the people who came to pick it up every week. Oh, it's up. like my mom was knocking on doors for Avon. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, what's, what's a little the sad part of the story is both of my parents are gone now and they never, my dad did a little, but they never really got to see the success that we've had. I mean, they saw it, my dad did, but my mom passed away in 2013. So we were just getting rolling and getting some momentum going. And, and my dad died the exact same day, five years later, February 9th but I mean it, so I, um you know it's 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 life I mean life isn't always how we want it it's not it, you don't you don't you can't make this stuff up and you can't draw it up like this it's just how it happened and so yeah. they're looking down from heaven and they they see the seeds that they planted are coming to fruition and in, in their son's life and so uh, yes that's the legacy they left you're just a continuing that legacy um, so and I and you guys got Bricia's mom in the business, so now yeah, you've yeah. gone that other generation there. Yeah. Um, so you said them looking down from heaven. That was for people who don't know. We always come to these things. I have four or five things I want to talk to my partner on, and my partner has four or five things they want to talk to me about. So one of the things I had on the list for you is. I don't think many people know this. You went and got a master's degree in theology, and yep. but never intended to be a minister. You always knew you wanted to do business. So can you talk about the, you know, because I know how important faith is to your life. Uh, yep. Can you share some thoughts on that? I would love to. Is this... I'm, I mean, I don't know how what I don't know how deep I can go into the faith thing. I you know sometimes when we're in we're in conventions, they say not to talk about you know faith, but you know I'll well on these chopping it up, there is no item that's off limits. Okay. Trust me, <laughs> anything is game for this. Okay, well, okay, so yeah, I went. 
Power of association is huge. I went to a, after high school, I went and became the MVP of a basketball team, Mid-State Technical College in Wisconsin Rapids. I'm sure you've heard, you know, Wisconsin Rapids. That's definitely, yeah. and Mid-State, whatever you said, I think that's right up there with Harvard, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yeah, very close, <laughs> neck and neck. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to Mid-State, be great, I became all all-star basketball player, but my environment was terrible. It was just people that were bringing me down, and I'm like, I got to get out. I did great basketball-wise, but I need to get out of this environment. And so um, I had, I had, I don't know if you know Amway, and, and the Worldwide Dream Builder Amway group, they had, did non-denominational church services. And so in one of these services, when I was 15, my parents went to their first FED free enterprise day and they gave their life to God and became Christian and they bought the Jesus film. They brought it home to me. I put this Jesus film in the, in the, it was a VHS um, tape and watched it. And I just figured, you know, I just really believed that this was right, that he's the true God. And so I gave my life to Christ and and then I go to this mid-state technical college and I'm in this environment that like, this isn't good for my, you know, my, I'm not strong enough. And so I took a whole year off of school and, and ended up going to uh, Northwestern Bible school and studied the Bible for three years. And, but I knew, like you said, I knew I didn't want to be a Bible teacher. I didn't want to, you know, be a pastor or go into the ministry, but I knew based on what I had learned up until that point, that I believe the Bible has a, a strong impact in any area of business that I go into, that it can, you know, the message, the overall message of the Bible can help uh, many people. And I, if I have that in my heart and in my mind, I can, you know, give that blessing to those that I come in contact with. And so I studied for three full years that and, um, you know, and really some of the lessons that it's taught me is just, I mean, just one, I, I take the stories out of the Bible a lot of times and try to help help people see um, how those stories back then can have impact and bless our lives. And, and one, of, one of those stories that has been probably the foundation of who we are today, who I am and, and my wife is today, is, is the story when Moses sent the 12 spies into the land. I don't know if you remember. And it, it, he, the 12 were out there and Joseph, uh, uh, Joseph and Caleb were the only positive ones. The promised land was there. God's like, well, I want you to take the land, go spy it out. These 12 spies come back. Uh, Joshua and Caleb were the only positive two and the, the other 10 were negative. And so Joshua and Caleb are like, this is this is the promised land. We can do it. And the other 10, no, we can't. Well, what did the people do? They listened to the negative and they ended up, the Israelites ended up wandering around for 40 years because they listened to the negativity. And in one part in, in numbers, it says, we see ourselves as grasshoppers. I'm looking at myself. It's, it says right there, numbers 13, 33. We see ourselves as grasshoppers. And so the, the people in the promised land are also seeing us as grasshoppers. And that, so the message there is how do we see ourselves? How are we seeing ourselves? Because if you see yourselves as defeated, when you are talking to people, they also will see you as defeated. They're not going to want to do business with you. And so, and also don't, you know, two lessons, don't listen to the negativity. Otherwise you're going to wander around for, I don't know how many years until you switch that mental thinking and become positive, you know? And so just, I mean, there's like, go through so many stories, but faith for us has been really the cornerstone when things have gotten tough because life does get tough. And we've been through, we had our commissions at 10,000 a month and it went down to a thousand pretty much overnight. And it was a, a moment where we either need to keep going, you know, or do we throw in the towel? And so we've had, but it's the faith for us. That's, you know, when we boil it all down, it's like, who, who are we, cre are we created for excellence or not? And then you look at these circum, right? I mean, circumstances always are happening to us that maybe aren't always nice and always good, but it's the reaction. It's how we react to those circumstances. And for us, I mean, knowing 
if you come from the perspective, and Bricia is sick of me always being so dang positive because sometimes when <laughs> adversity comes, you know, I, I've learned, and this is a big legacy my parents taught me too, but and then through you know studying the Bible, but I've learned when adversity comes, put a smile on your face and just try to, try to. I know it's not always fun, but try to do it and, and understand that this adversity is going to make you a better person and it's gonna, you're going to grow and it's an opportunity for growth. But a lot of people during the adversity, when it gets tough, they quit and then they, there's no opportunity to create the story. This, that's the, the adversity is the story. I mean, what kind of story is it is I sign up at my company and boom, I'm I'm a millionaire and there was no struggle involved. Right. You know, I mean, that maybe would happen. I don't think it happens. To, I, I haven't heard I haven't really heard that story anywhere. You know, I mean, success is always harder than you think it's going to be. And so so if you have the perspective that adversity is necessary and it's a part of the process of, of growing and it's a, it's a way to create your story because that's what we're all we all have to create our story. Randy, your story is incredible. And there's people that are listening here that have stories, they just need to overcome these, you know, they need to be overcomers and create the story. And, and so putting a smile on your face and, and having, because, you know, we would be going through something hard and she's like, stop being positive about it. This is bad. Be, <laughs> be upset. Be negative with me for a little bit. So I need to have a little bit more of that in me too. To, <laughs> um, but, uh, it is. And then trying to, and then from there, from, you know, from the legacy of my parents and, and learning the Bible, instilling that mental toughness in our kids too, you know, and helping them see, looking at when things, bad things happen in school, taking them out of that and really show, okay, this, this, and this happened. Well, this is an opportunity for you to go back to that kid or do this or go back to your teacher and communicate and learn how to communicate better because you, you know, when, when kids are in school, they don't, they get froze. They don't know what to say because their communication skills aren't right yet. But you, you know, just te te instilling those same principles in our kids and, and belief and believing that they can, you know, be great kids, you know, things that I didn't. And I always tell them, I didn't learn the, these principles that I just shared with, with you. Now I didn't learn this stuff till I was 15, you know, now if you are listening to this and you see adversity is good, you know, it's a way to overcome, um, you know, that, that kind of stuff is in, it's so valuable um, that people need to hear. And now I get to leave the legacy onto my kids, you know, those principles that are true and I've seen it work in my life. And now I'm going to be able to watch my kids go through their own struggle. And I, I'm not going to, just because we have the financial means to bless them, they're going to have to go out there and work and they're going to have to go out there and, and, and find a living for themselves. It's, there's no, that's how they learn. And I, just from your story of being poor, Randy, I'm going to, I'm going to make my kids, you know, get out there and work too and figure it out themselves. I'm not going to give everything to them. And that's what we need. I think that's, you know, this day and age of people raising children's and, and just giving them tablets and telling them to, you know, just, go on your tablet and not having restrictions on that and not teaching them these principles and just letting them be a victim of society. You know, we need to be the ones that take control of our children and, and be parents, you know, for them so that our next generation have, we have hope, right? We, we don't want zombies out there. So there's a lot to unpack there, but that's a little bit of, you know, our faith story too. And I'm glad I got, thanks for asking. It's very dear to me and I'm glad I could share a little bit. This last issue you raised, um, when I, uh, is the scariest thing to me, I think, for someone to navigate. Now you, you've got four kids. You guys have made it. You're I always joke. I used to tell Mauricio, your CEO, I'm like, okay, if we were going to make a magazine and we say, okay, we want the perfect couple to be the, the the icon you know for the avatar for network marketing if you called hollywood uh casting they would send angelo and bricia they're the ones what was the name of that they probably still do it, that monthly magazine amway did with the diamond files. chips the diamond chips okay you guys are like the perfect couple you want on the diamond tips magazine right um you're and you're by anybody's um, reckoning, extremely wealthy. The, the kind of income you guys have puts you in the top 2%, 1%, maybe even half percent of the world. 
now you have four kids and they don't get this greatest gift I had, which is being born poor. Mm-hmm. How are, what, can you dig deeper in that? How are you guys? And for and and you're not homes. You were homeschool, but you're not homeschooling your kids. So I'm wondering about that. And just how are you going to prepare them for the real world where they don't? You know, how are you guys uh, approaching that? Well, we we always tell them what we had to do. I mean, we we tell them the story that I you know the the company's going bankrupt and the valets the valet business and. Part, uh, selling card. I mean, we go through and we tell them everything that we had to go through and that we bought our starter kit, you know, starting at zero. And and so you say we're the Hollywood couple, but I just don't, I mean, that's, that's so um, humbling for you to say that. And it's, it's, I feel great about it, but I mean, the reality is we just, we fell in love and we didn't really know a lot what we were doing. You know, we just bought our, our starter kit and we started sharing from our heart, you know, and, and uh, so bringing the kids back and showing them pictures of our of our showing them where we came from. They need to know that, you know, and really getting the visual and and telling them all the hard things I really go through. I mean, I really communicate to them the hard things that we went through and and the struggle that it was early on, you know. And and so that's that's one thing. And really, like you said about reading, really deve- bringing my is a nine, I have a nine and a seven year old, and then we have twins that are a year and a half. Twin, all four boys, and my nine and seven year old are reading are reading now, and getting them to love reading, like you talked about earlier, and getting those principles in there, and and being people, being humble, and and not just because we have a nice house and a nice pool doesn't make you better than your classmates, you know, and. And uh, it's not about how much you have. It's about who you are as a person and your character and really instilling those principles in them. And, you know, once they, you know, we live right next to a golf course here, but I plan on my kids, you know, once they get old enough, I want them to go and work over there and meet people and just, you know, uh, that's where they're going to learn. You know, when I, when I think about all the, you know, from the valet business, I worked when I was at Midstate, I worked at a, a mobile gas station down the road, you know, and I was the clerk there. I was, you know, the night manager once school got done. And and just work, just like when I think about what I learned in that gas station, working in a gas station, and then from there, you know, well, I worked at a grocery store before that. And all these, all these things that happened and all the places that I worked and like those early on, that's what made me who I am today, you know, and I don't want my kids to miss that. I don't want them to miss the opportunity to go out there and work and to meet people and to have their own experiences, you know, and, um, and obviously, to think of a business, I want them to be entrepreneurs, obviously, I want them to be involved in network marketing, but I'm not going to control their future either, I'm going to let them decide what they want to do. And so finding their passion, you know, and being able to encourage that passion that they have and let and give them what they need to to excel at their passion whatever whatever it is that they want to do so um yeah i was homeschooled up until i was 13 years old and then i went to school to play basketball i love basketball so i wanted to play basketball and they said you have to go to school half time so i would show up at lunchtime and do my classes and play basketball and then in my senior year i had to go the full time that's what that was the rules had changed but um, but yeah, and so our kids, they go to a two day a week school. So it's kind of a universe it's called a university model school. Ah. They, yeah, they, they, it's the full school with sports that has the full K through 12 Mondays and Wednesdays, they're in school. And then Tuesdays and Thursdays, they have their home day where they're at home and they're able to get all their homework done by 1230. We have a teacher that comes over and walks them through all their curriculum and what they have to do. And so then that, that's why yesterday I was able to take my son to a golf tournament. <coughs> he got done at you know 1230 with his school and he's able to go out and and, and play golf and stuff. So, uh, yeah, this, it's, this this teacher that comes over, is this provided by the school or this is somebody you hire? Usually, yeah, usually the parents have to be the ones are the ones that take the kids through their homework. But it's not I'm not I'm not a that's not who I am. That's not who Brice is. So we have someone else that comes in and and, and does that, does that for us so we can work and, and do other things that we need to do on those days as well. So it's like a hybrid of homeschooling and private school, right? Exactly. Yeah. But what 
so when I think about homeschool, it's, it's amazing. It's it, my mom was a pioneer in that because it was, I was in kindergarten in 1986 homeschooling in Wisconsin. It was practically illegal. I mean, it was like, not. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. But she saw the environment in the school that way I was in. And I, I wasn't like, I mean, kindergarten, I didn't really, I was, I don't know if I was slow or whatever. Everyone learns different. And, and I wasn't able to get these worksheets done and all the other kids got to go and play. And I didn't, I, I wasn't able to understand the worksheet. So I, she made me stay in that seat and finish the worksheet. And I didn't even understand it. And my mom just came and observed that situation. And she just took me out of school and I was five years old and ended up homeschooling, figuring out how to homeschool and my brother as well. And, and, Amazing. Um, Amazing. Yeah, it, it, and and it, I mean that was another thing that probably formed my character because I maybe I wasn't the smartest kid as far as like how to spell and how to you know do certain things as far as the academics are, but the principles she instilled in me that are more important than how people skills and she would take me to the grocery store and we would do math on how many you know how many ounces in this box of pancakes or how much does this cost is this cheaper or is this cheaper. Well, let's do the math. How, you know, you got, this is, there's two pounds in here and this has one pound, whatever, you know, and figure out what's cheaper. And she would, she took the time and the patience to do that, which I don't have (laughs) who I am, but she, that's who she is. And she was able to do that. And she worked a full-time job as a nurse and my dad worked full-time. And, and so to be able to send my kids to a school to get, it's a Christian school that they have good friends that are, you know, not just good, good people there. And, and then they also get to be home and we get to have more, a little bit more control on some of the principles and things that we want to teach them as well. So it's a unique opportunity. Very thankful for that. Net- but all because of network marketing, giving us the opportunity to put our kids in a school like that and have a teacher come over, you know, I mean, yeah. it's crazy. Yeah. It's pretty, it's it's neat. Well, that's what I'm trying to explain in my prosperity podcast. I do in my prosperity books you know, you can, you can repeat these platitudes like money doesn't buy happiness, but yep. what are money and material things don't make you uh, uh, happy, but money and material things give you better choices and they money and material things allow you self-expression and that self-expression does make you happier. Yes. And having the choices like being able to make that for your kids and their schooling. Mm-hmm. Um, money is a, an incredible lucra- lubricant of life. And it's wonderful that we can give people this unlimited income potential. Yep. Um, the, the two boys, the nine and seven year olds, um, when they were babies, when they were toddlers, you guys were in the throes of serious building. How did you make that work? Um, we we just, it was one or the other. I mean, it was me focused on the kids and Bricia doing, doing the work, or it was me going out there and doing the work and she had the kids. And then we we had to bring her mother in and help us. We did countless trips and countless um you know conventions and going to see our teams and she had to stay with both kids we just i think you know when that when the dream is big enough you just do whatever it takes to make it work and we had people that needed to see us it was critical times we had to take when our firstborn was 6 weeks old we had a trip in the Dominican Republic that we had to take and we didn't he see he was nursing so wasn't like we could leave them. So we brought my mother. I mean, and we were, we were only making probably five to $6,000 a month. And this trip in the Dominican Republic was going to be at least probably seven to 10,000. So, you know, you talk about investing in your business, it doesn't make good business sense there, but we saw something bigger. And so we brought our mother-in-law and we all went to the Dominican Republic and stayed three weeks there um and the trip costed us seven to ten thousand we were only making five and and we just believed and and you know we believed in the people there and and the commitment of the people that were there we went we didn't go and just you know start cold recruiting there we had a small team it was a small team at the time of very committed people 
And we believed in those people. And that's what made us make that sacrifice and do it. And it has paid off thousands of times more out through the years, you know, because of the leadership that's there. There's great leadership there. And they've stayed and continue to cultivate the team and grow. And um, that was just one trip. And then when our second one was born, he also, it was weird. He was also six weeks old. And we also had to do a trip, you know, when he was six weeks. And we took the whole family again and made it work and and worked you know and just basically did that you know which it was the time in our life that we needed to make those sacrifices because our dream was big enough our dream of having financial freedom um so that when they're older when they're six seven and eight hopefully the goal right is to be able to have the lifestyle that we wouldn't have to make those sacrifices anymore um you know and that's what it's been and so now i i already have we already have I have two trips planned already. It's not that we've retired, but they're, we are full for, you know, the reason is because I think our industry is in a very critical time and I see the momentum's happening now. So we're out making, we're making sacrifices again, not because we have to, but because of the opportunity and, and what's, what's coming. So um, now we have, you know, we have able to have two nannies that help us, you know, that we can with trust, leave them with them. Cause it's not, ideal to have your mother-in-law take care of the kids for you now that we have four we wouldn't want that and she wouldn't want that and it's not (laughs) she can come and hang out with us now you know and not have to be taking care of our kids so now you know this business has allowed us to have have two full-time nannies that can help us with our kids so we can focus on the things we need to as well so yeah but yeah the sacrifices early on i mean i i remember when brisa was pregnant you know she did some trips she went to New York and then to Florida and did some trips as well. And I stayed with the two kids. And, and so it was, it, it just is um, interesting to think back, um, you know, the sacrifices that, that were made, you know, to have what we have today, but that, you know, but the, the, the beauty of that is, you know, when I think about normal businesses, people travel for their work and they go, but it's for a paycheck right now. And that's the residual income about it. some people's i I don't really know if everyone knows the real full impact of residual income, you know, because everyone's out there traveling and working for a paycheck, you know, or whatever. Even if it, even if it's a business, you got to sell so much right now this month to get paid. But with with this, it's like we're getting paid from work that we did five, six years ago, seven years ago now, even even 12 years ago when we first signed up, you know, these people, because they want to keep ordering these your products. It's a continual thing. And if you treat people right, you know, you're going to have a customer for life. And and that's where the real residual income comes in so that you truly can make money while you're sleeping, you know, and especially with our digital age where we are today, you know, with international businesses and in Europe or wherever you are, I mean, you sleep, your volume goes up, but you got to put in the hard work and the sacrifices early on to make it work, you know. Amen. Amen. Yeah. But uh, you got anything else on your list that we didn't get to? Um, no, I, I I I have a list here, and I I got through everything that I wanted to. So I'm you know. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yes, and I think I got through everything on my list. Uh, I think this is a, a delightful, enchanting, but más importante, uh, a really empowering, insightful conversation that people are really going to be able to really apply the i i just I, i'm so loved this is this project is what lights me up right now in my life doing this every wednesday it just like today you won't even have seen it yet um today while we're recording just went live the chopping it up with juan carlos barrios from mexico And talk about a story. He had six brothers. I think they were all boys. I think there were seven of them, but I'm not sure, but I believe they were all boys. But seven kids and two parents in a small two-room apartment in Mexico. His mother had a second-grade education and his father had a third-grade education or vice versa. And he has uh, just ascended to the 
pinnacle of success you can do in our profession and now is just an you know a wildly successful entrepreneur with many ventures publishing company and other stuff that he's doing and these stories like your story like Bricia's story uh like my story I mean these are the stories that people need to hear and so I mean I could see just while we're talking I would see stuff popping up on my phone about the show with Wonka this morning and this oh, yeah. is what happens every Wednesday and Thursday I'm deluged with comments from people about the show that week uh we're really we're really making a difference for people with these recordings so I cannot thank you enough I just appreciate you and Bricia and and appreciate you taking the time to do this and let the world outside of your company there's a lot of people in a lot of other companies that need to be exposed to the the light and the insights that you guys have so thank you for being a part of this well thank you for for inviting me and thank you for doing what you do i know you're making a huge impact in our industry and in many people's lives so this has been a real treat for me to to be able to do this with you and hopefully i was able we together i guess was able to add value to you you know add value to people and to be able to um really encourage people about belief and that they can they can do whatever they put their mind to so thank you so much randy i really appreciate you and all that you do all right you guys watching listening like share subscribe tell your team and thanks for watching or listening and we'll see you again next week